Dear students, in the previous lecture, I discussed about the interaction of heavy charged particles with matter. And we found that the important properties of the heavy charged particles with regard to their interaction are the stopping power. The stopping power is nothing but the loss of energy in the unit thickness minus dE by dx. And we also saw how that is related to the energy and charge of the ion. So there is a term depending upon the property of the ion. It is another term depending upon the property of the absorber medium that is Nz, electron density, number of atoms per cc into the atomic number of the material. So it is essentially the electrons per cc. So heavy charged particles are losing energy relatively much faster because they, 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 they don't travel much because of the higher mass and higher charge. So mz squared by E as you did recall the previous lecture, the energy if the, as the energy decreases, the stopping power increases but as the, as the, as the Bragg curve signifies at the end of the journey and finally the velocity of the ion becomes less than velocity of electrons and the heavy charged particle picks up electrons and then stops. At the end of this uh, track or the range, the stopping will be purely by the nuclear. But the, in the beginning, it is electronic stopping wherein the ionization and excitation are the dominant mode of interaction. Now we will discuss the interaction of fast electrons with the matter which also includes the beta particles, beta plus and beta minus. Okay, so the fast electrons or beta particles, the interaction mechanisms are same, even positrons will be the same way. And the typical energies of this fast electrons or beta particles that we handle are in the range of few kV to few mg. Now this, in terms of the type of mechanism, for interaction of these fast electrons with the matter, we can say that there are two types of processes that occur. First is the collisional energy loss. That means the electrons collide with the electrons of the medium through which they are passing and they can cause the ionization and excitation very much like in the case of heavy charged particles. But the, in addition to this, there is another mode of loss of energy and that is the true radiative energy loss in which case the a continuous radiation called Brimstalen is emitted when the fast electrons are passing through the medium. We will discuss more on this in subsequently. The major differences between the interaction of heavy charged particles with fast electrons, let us discuss this first. So uh, first is, firstly the velocity of electrons is much much higher than the velocity of heavy charged particles for the same energy let us say few kV to few MeV. So because of that you know these velocities are very high the delta E by dx the stopping power for fast electrons is much lower than that for the heavy charged particles. If you recall the stopping power formula E by dx is equal to mz square by E. In fact it, is, it will not remain the same when it comes to electrons but the velocity comes in the denominator and so velocity is high that means the stopping power is low, grossly speaking. The second important point is that the energy transferred by electron to the electron in the medium in one position. So considering the same equation in case of heavy charged particle, the maximum energy an electron can gain when it is struck by the incident particle maybe alpha or electron given by 4 mm capital M small m e0 upon m plus m square cos theta. In fact, it's cos theta theta equal to 0. The maximum energy is lost when theta equal to 0. Now, if you substitute for capital M as mass of the electron, so both capital M and small m are same in the case of electron interaction. And so this it will become E max equal to 4 m square e0 upon m plus m is 2m into square 4m square. So it will be e0. 
That means the electron can lose all its energy in single collision when it is colliding with an electron. Because of these processes, you will find that the electron can get backscattered, back, scattered in all angles in a single collision. So this is a major difference when it comes to interaction of electrons with matter besides the fast heavy charge particles. The third difference is that the electrons move in a tortuous path. The reason for that is in the second point that is the electron can lose energy in a single collision. So because of that, suppose you have an electron here, which is colliding with the another electron, this electron can get scattered in different directions. And so because of that, the when the electron is going, it is scattered, it can further get scattered. Whenever it is interacting with an electron, it can go. So this electron can go in a zigzag path, and so you can you can say the different electrons will be moving in the tortoise path, like a tortoise in a zigzag fashion. So then you cannot define a well-defined range for the electrons because their motion is taught to us. That, that, that is because of the large energy transferred in single collision in case of fast electrons. The, the difference, another different major difference is that when the electrons are interacting with the medium, particularly at energies which are of the relativistic order, that there is an emission of a continuous gamma radiation. Bremsstrahlung. That Bremsstrahlung is derived from the word breaking radiation. That means when the electron is accelerated or decelerated in the vicinity of a nucleus because of this electromagnetic interaction, the electron loses energy in the form of photons. So that can be explained from electromagnetic theory. And this happens when the electron, the energy of the electron is of the order of relativistic energy. That means beta equal to d by c. See the velocity of electron, see the speed of light, and when it is close to one, then the electron is relativistic. And so that happens for the electron when the energy is of the order of one MeV. And therefore, the MeV order of energy electrons will undergo a large fraction of energy will be lost through very installing radiation. The same thing doesn't happen in case of protons of same energy, because for one MeV proton, the beta value will be of is will be around 0 0.046, which is much much less than one. Therefore, proton is not relativistic at energy of one MeV. The result of that, you don't see brain stalin in the case of heavy charge particles at these energies. High energy it may be possible. We'll discuss that later on subsequently. So let us first discuss the collisional energy loss and radiated energy loss with regard to the stopping power. So we will not go into details of the derivation of this formula because they are quite complicated. But hence Bithe, in fact, derived this formula. And the, so here, instead of one type of collision in a stopping power, we have two types of losses. One is the loss in a collision with electrons. So they call it collisional energy loss. And this collisional energy loss again has the two terms: the electronic properties, the ion, single ion that is impinging. 2 pi e power 4 upon m0 v square, where v is the velocity of electron and mz is the electron density in the medium. And this is term again the velocity dependent is a relativistic term. In the case of beta particles and fast electrons, relativistic term becomes important because beta is significant, close to 1. But let us not uh, go into too much details of the relativistic term. The, it, it simply is sufficient to say that the, in the collisional energy losses again depend upon the velocity of the electron and the electron density of the medium in the, in the fashion similar to that of the heavy charge particles. And the radiative energy loss, they are called radiative minus d by dx r, is again given in terms of the electron the, the atom density. In the, so, nz is the thing by electron density. E is the energy of the ion, e to the power 4 upon 137 m0 square c to the power 4 and some term depending upon E and m0 c square. So, electron is going to lose energy not only by collision with electrons which leads to emission and excitation but also by loss in terms of emission of a electromagnetic radiation that is William star. And so the total energy loss now by the electron is sum of the collisional energy loss plus the 
radiating energy loss and for the higher energy electrons and particularly you know it is if it is going to stop in a high z medium then the radiative losses become very very significant just to give you the feel of that from the dominant role of radiative energy losses the ratio of radiative to collisional energy loss so this upon this radiative upon collision collisional losses if you see these two terms in the simple way, it can be written as E z upon 700. So we will not bother about the terms how it has been arrived, but E is the energy in MeV, z is the atomic number of the absorber upon 700. So it is a very simplified way of finding out the ratio of radiative to collisional energy losses. So what it tells is that higher is the energy of the ion, higher is the radiative energy loss. Higher is the Z of the absorbing material, higher Z materials, you know, higher is the radiative energy loss. So if you are if you are having a high Z material in the vicinity of a beta emitter, then you will have more of radiation. So that's why you know you handle beta sources, you have to be very careful about the nearby high energy material, high Z materials. So for beta particles of the order of 1 to 2 MeV, in fact. Radiative energy losses are not that high, but if it is a high absorber, high jet material, then the radiative losses become significant for beta particles of this energy domain. So when you do beta counting, the absorber, the, the, the plate on which you make the source becomes important. You should not make the source on a high jet packing material. You can make on aluminum, not on stainless steel or any other high jet. So let's now discuss more the Brimstalen. The Brimstalen, as I mentioned, it derives from the name as breaking radiation. That means you suppose you apply a break. So when you apply a break on electron, this electron is losing energy. So how does it lose energy? Say if it is going in the vicinity of a nucleus, a nucleus has got charged particles like protons. So electron can be accelerated in the vicinity of the nucleus or it can be decelerated, then any accelerating or decelerating particle, charged particle loses energy by means of emission of electromagnetic radius. So essentially in the electric field of the nucleus, if the electron is accelerating or decelerating, then this will emit a electromagnetic radiation. And this electromagnetic radiation is in fact in, in the case of electrons, you know, it is 10 power 6 times more for electrons than that for protons. So why, why it is so that we did not uh, have the brim type of radiation in the case of protons and alpha particles. So the explanation lies here. That is the force, the Coulombic force between the electron and the nucleus. We can say mass into acceleration, mass m into a. So the acceleration is f upon m. And the, the Brimstalen intensity is proportional to square of acceleration. So acceleration square. So if you assume that other things are constant, then it is 1 by m square. So the Brimstalen intensity is proportional to 1 by m square, where m is the mass of the accelerating ion. So now based on this, you can say the intensity of Brimstalen for electron divided by electric intensity of Brimstalen for protons can be in terms of inverse ratio of their masses that is the mass of the proton square upon mass of electron square and you know the mass of proton to mass of electron is about 2000 and square of that is of the drop million times. So that explains the Brimstalen intensity for fast electrons a million times more than that for the so that as a result of that you would find we don't have Rubinstalen for protons and other particles of energies of few MeV. But you can see that when the proton becomes relativistic, when the proton energy becomes GeV, giga electron volt. In fact, there are now actually machines which are running at 1000 GeV. So at 1000 GeV, proton becomes relativistic and you will find that the the, you will have the high energy electromagnetic uh, radiation emitted by protons. So only we are talking about the low energy at, at MeV range, 
protons and alpha particles we don't talk about red star but if you have relativistic protons and alpha particles they will also emit dim star now this dim star line i see the spectrum the energy dim star line is a continuous energy spectrum so if you have electron of energy this much then maximum energy of dim star line can be energy of the electron but other it is a continuous spectrum and the average energy will be somewhere one third of the maximum energy so dim star line gives you a continuous spectrum with average energy one third of the maximum energy of the fast electron this is in fact a, a mechanism to produce gamma rays from electrons these days you can easily have high in electron high energy electron accelerators so if you want to have a intense source of photons you can use high energy electron sources and bombard them on high z material like tantalum and you can get or tungsten you can get electrons again the photons of all energy spectrum okay so now like we discussed the range of heavy charged particles and what we saw that the heavy charged particles the the transmission graph what i was showing here is the is the energy the intensity of the initial electron is i0 it is passing through a thin slice of material and the transmitted intensity is i this is delta x then i upon i0 that is called the transmitted intensity for fast electrons if it is a mono energetic electrons like we have one nmb electron then it will be just monotonically decreasing the intensity of this because the the electrons get, get lost from the the path in the beginning itself unlike in the case of alpha particles for alpha particles so we have like this this is for alpha or protons for electrons you will find electrons start getting lost from the path from the beginning itself and that's why we cannot define a, you don't have a well defined range for fast electrons so normally you know if you, you there is no point doing an experiment to determine the range of electrons for monoenergetic electrons but for beta particles what happens the beta particles it has been found experimentally that the in transmitted transmission transmission intensity follows an exponential decay that is given by this expression i equal to i0 e raised to minus nx where n is called the beta absorption coefficient and this n the coefficient correlates well with the beta end point energy what means end point energy the maximum energy of beta particle now you know that the beta spectrum is a continuous spectrum why it is continuous spectrum we discussed in the beta decay that because of the emission of three part three body interaction so you have a electron you have a neutrino and you have the daughter nucleus so the energy the q beta q beta is shared in a different infinite number of ways between among the electron neutrino and the heavy residue and therefore this continuous spectrum of beta is responsible for the exponential decay so it does not have any phenomenological explanation why beta decay attenuation transmission graph shows an exponential decay so what essentially happens is that the the low energy part of the beta spectrum gives rise to the initial part of the exponential decay and the later part the high energy component of beta spectrum gives you the later part so it is a fictitious uh, type of uh, correlation it doesn't have a any particular basis based on a particular concept but it it, it became very handy in the earlier times you know when did, we did not have the advanced detector systems uh, then you people are determining uh, what you do you take a you take a source of beta and you put foils of different thickness different foils you no know? you are you are measuring the lost in the intensity as a function of you put keep on putting different foils and what fraction is going out so this is the experiment you know this is the so many foils you put and you generate this graph so i and i0 and what they found this is an experimental finding that the beta decay attenuation intensity is attenuated in a exponential fashion and this attenuation factor absorption coefficient n it has got an excellent correlation and so from the n value 
one could identify the endpoint energy. At that, at that time, the, the radiochemistry people particularly, you know, we did not have uh, no access to high uh, equipments. So you like a mass spectrometer. Now you can determine this energy spectrum by a mass spectrometer. But do so you want to find out endpoint energy or beta? You just do a simple attenuation experiment like this one, and you can find out what is the energy of this beta. So uh, beta counting, in fact, uh, is requires that you, you need to really take care of this attenuation. So if you have a thick absorber, for example, you are doing beta counting. How do you do beta counting? You have a sample. You're on a plate and you put the precipitate and you put it in a you have a detector so beta will go from here to here you detect the beta now if this absorber material is having high z material like lead or stainless steel or tantalum then there will be backscattering that is one backscattering and second is the self-absorption so this precipitate will be absorbing, it will absorb and third may be the radiative losses. So if it is a high z material, brimstalling also can take place. So when you do beta counting, one has to be very careful not to use high z backing material for beta. Okay, I did not discuss this part in the beginning as a, you know, one of the dominant mode of interaction of fast electrons because the energy lost by this mode is a very small fraction. So it does not really matter when it comes to loss of energy by electron. But it is a very fascinating topic to discuss. And in fact, it is also used in the detection of uh, electrons. And this is called the Cherenkov radiation. Some people call it Cherenkov. You, uh, I'll say we'll, we can use the term Cherenkov. So what is Cherenkov radiation? So blue, uh, the blue you know, light that is emitted in, in, in a react swimming pool type of reactor. So that is a particular you know, manifestation of the, the Serenkov radiation that is emitted and the beta particle is passing through a dielectric medium. So what is Serenkov radiation? When a charged particle passes through a transparent dielectric medium with velocity more than the phase velocity of light in that medium, then this charged particle emits a electromagnetic radiation which is in the UV visible range. So the energy of the photons that are coming out is very small. So a tiny fraction of the electron energy is utilized in Cherenkov radiation. But it is very interesting to see even this one if you put appropriate photomultiplier cube you can detect the electrons energy, electron intensity by means of this Cherenkov detector. So what is uh, what exactly happens? Why why what is the mechanism of this one? So what happens that, first of all, the condition for this Serenkov radiation is that the velocity of electron has to be more than C by N. What is C? C is the speed of light, which is universal constant. N is the refractive index of the material through which the particle is passing through. Now, if you see the V by C, velocity of the electron upon C, velocity of light, called beta then it becomes beta n has to be more than more than one so the condition for Serenkov radiation is beta n is more than one how can the beta n be more than one the velocity of the ion can be close to c at the most okay so it cannot be more than c, c. the relativistic ion we just now saw one mev electron has the beta value 0.94 but it is not more than c so, if you have a medium of high refractive index, like glass 1.5, there are certain materials, you know, dielectric materials, which are transparent and have the refractive index close to 1.5, then C upon 1.5. So, the phase velocity of that light in that medium becomes much less than C. And therefore, velocity of the electron becomes higher than the velocity of, phase velocity of light in that medium. And as the electron is moving, essentially the, the concept behind is that, that the electromagnetic field associated with the electron, electron is moving in the direction, it has got electromagnetic field associated with, that field moves with velocity C by N. And so the electron is moving much at much higher speed than the 
velocity of the field associated with it in that medium and it is like you know the, the field is left behind the, the electrons and so that field is appears the, because of the field leaving behind the ion it is emitting a core and this condition is made for a very small time because the ion electron will finally lose energy in the medium and the, the condition will be not met so till that condition is met which happens only in the high energy part of the beta then you will find for that particular time in the initial phase of this it is a, it's a journey it will emit that light and that light happens to be in the blue region that is why the Serenkov radiation is having blue in, in blue blue range so this is a typical swimming pool reactor Apsara U in Trombe and you can see the beautiful blue blue color in the swimming pool so any swimming pool type of reactor if there is a fission has taken place then the fission products are emitting beta particles of high energy and you will see blue light so Serenkov radiation the in terms of energy loss is not much but it is important in terms of the beauty of the radiation and the detection of the beta by Serenkov lastly I will discuss the interaction of positrons positrons are also anti electrons so the in terms of collisional energy loss and radiation energy loss they are similar to electrons there is no difference but there is a subtle difference between electrons and positrons that these positrons when they Thermalize in the medium, the positron comes close to an electron and annihilates with an electron. So electron positron annihilate, and you you get two. So the rest mass energy of electron positron is 1.022 MeV. That energy is now emitted in the form of photons. And since the electron and positron as the thermalized pair momentum is zero, the two 511 keV photons are emitted at 180 degree. So this is the positron annihilation gives you two 511 kV gamma rays which are emitted at 180 degree. Why at 180 degree? Because the momentum is zero. When the positron is thermalized, its momentum is zero. Electron is assumed to be already stationary or very low energy. So at that time when the a, a system is annihilating, mass is converted into energy in terms of two photons. The two photons have to have zero momentum and that is possible when it is emitted at 180 degrees. In fact, there is another mechanism of three gamma emission. And when the three gamma emission happens, then they have to be of at 180 degrees each. So, but the three gamma probability is much smaller than the two gamma and in fact, very rarely you see three gamma. So, the reason for the two photons to be emitted at 180 degrees because of the zero momentum and another very interesting aspect is the positronium atom formation. In fact, the positron and electron can form an atom like hydrogen atom, proton and electron hydrogen atom, positron and electron positronium atom. And the positronium atom has a beautiful chemistry. So there is a subject of positronium chemistry itself. And lastly, the positron emission tomography. The fact that the two photons are emitted at 180 degree is utilized in detecting the tumors in the human body by injecting a positron emitter like chlorine 18, carbon, carbon 11, oxygen, oxygen 15 and so on. So many positron emitters when they are put into the body and they emit positron, the positron annihilate, give 2511 kV gamma ray and they can be used to detect the position of the tumors in the human body. So we have a lot of applications of this positron. I thought I will touch upon this aspect in this particular. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Next time I will discuss the gamma ray interaction. Thank you.